Good morning and welcome to our service today. We've reached a harrowing time as a nation, having heard of the 100,000 deaths attributed to coronavirus over the last year. Equally, we have heard calls to pray as a nation, and that call to pray has been echoed since the pandemic began for many Christian leaders, only now is it hitting national headlines. The call to pray is something that God wants of us every day. And later this morning, we're going to focus in our time of prayer on a prayer for our nation and for ourselves in light of this news we've heard this week. And then later we will unpack the word of God and look at how model behavior is seen through troubled and trying times and how we live wisely in light of the mystery and misunderstanding of what is going on at this time. For many, we are asking why? What is going on? Why is this happening? And there are many mysteries that we will not comprehend. And yet God in his revealed word has given us revelation, truth to understand why this is happening, to understand what God's purpose is through it. Though not completely understood, because who has known the mind of God, we have the mind of Christ to help us respond to it well. Paul writes in 2 Timothy, in 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 16. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed in the world and was taken up to glory. This morning, let us come and view the mystery of God revealed in Jesus Christ. May our troubled minds find understanding from his words through his spirit this morning. Let me open in prayer before we sing our first song, Meekness and Majesty. Father God, we do cry out to you as a nation confused and lost. And we ask and pray for wisdom and for understanding. And certainly, Lord, for strength as we struggle through this together. May you strengthen our weak knees. May you calm our troubled minds. May you bring peace into our hearts. And Lord, may we, as we come to worship you this morning, have a glimpse of your glory and your grace. And may it fuel us to live for you in joy and hope. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. i 
imperishable, God the invisible, love indestructible, and frailty above. Lord of infinity, stooping so tenderly, lifts our humanity to the heights of His particularly wanted us to focus on the prayers for our nation and for ourselves as we look at that harrowing number of 100,000 deaths down to coronavirus. It makes us cry out, Lord, why? But also as a nation, we do need to come to a place of repentance, of confession, of knowing that we do sin and rebel against our God. Not to say that this coronavirus is a judgment against sin. However, it does remind us that we are unrighteous, that not one is holy. All have sinned and fallen short, and God calls us to a place of repentance and prayer. So this morning, perhaps you have something on your heart and mind that you need to confess before the Lord and say, Lord, I am sorry. Death and suffering reminds us of our weak, feeble and temporary status. But the cross of Christ, where Christ paid for our sin, reminds us of our value in him, our unworthiness, but our worth. And Christ has deemed us worthy. So after our prayer, we're going to sing another song about our worth in Christ, as sung by uh, the Gettys, written by Stuart Townend. But let us come now to this place of prayer. Dear God, we come before you as a people in desperate need. We acknowledge before you that we're not what we should be. We do not behave as we ought and we do not honour your name. Please forgive us. Dear God, thank you that you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Thank you that you do not treat our sins as we deserve, but rather deliver us from our sin through Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we cry out to you for compassion and grace, which we might learn through humility to express to one another in these dark days. Thank you, Father, for your discipline, for you discipline those you love. But now, Father God, we ask that in your mercy you will bring hope into the hearts and minds of your people. May you save the lost. Reach out to the prodigal as he repents and comes home. May we do the same for neighbour and family member. May we be prepared to shine in the light of the gospel into the darkened land and see men, women and children find faith, hope and healing at the feet of Jesus Christ. We mourn with those who mourn. We grieve with those who grieve. Yet one day we will see our mourning turn into praise and despair into hope. Dear God, please help our medical services as they meet the suffering head on. Grant them mercy and strength as they feel the onslaught physically and mentally. Renew their strength like the eagles. Redeem their time as they sacrifice so much for others. And may the believers who work amongst them be beacons of inspiration and hope to the one who sustains them. Dear God, may we in humility and repentance never cease in our prayer and supplication. Hear us, O God, and speak your words into our lives. Give us the bread of life today. 
Amen. And I'd just like to read to you Psalm 143. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Rescue me from my enemies, O Lord, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies. Destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. And may God bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you and give you peace as we sing our next song together. is not in what I am, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or
1 Corinthians 4 This then is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time each will receive their praise from God. Now brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, Do not go beyond what is written, then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of the one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign, and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign, so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are foolish for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? As we dip into 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it's worth remembering the greater context of the letter to the Corinthians. Chapters 1 to 3 flow into chapter 4 as chapter 4 will flow into chapter 5. So remembering that church cliques were forming around particular leaders. Some were saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, and no doubt there were more. But some 
were around men who professed to be teachers, but were not apostles themselves. Perhaps they were even false teachers whom Paul critiques and points out and warns believers of in many letters. Their appeal, of course, was their use of persuasive argument and style, demonstrating the worldly wisdom as opposed to the hidden mysteries of God and his wisdom, which Paul and the apostles revealed through the Holy Spirit. Now, in pagan terms, the mystery is the theme of their religion. It leads people to speculative reasoning, controversial argument, whilst God's teaching and indeed Jewish Old Testament teaching is themed on God revealing himself and making himself known. It was the opposite of Grecian or Greek thinking. When Paul concludes his letter to the Romans in chapter 16, verse 25, this is what he writes. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you see how Paul there says, there's mystery folks, but it's being revealed. And this is the revealed word of God. This is what I speak. This is what I preach. And I preach everywhere consistently. Now, many of us, especially British, enjoy mystery thrillers or the British murder mystery. It's quite possibly the most famous genre from Sherlock Holmes through to Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple. We enjoy the mystery. We enjoy the investigation and eventually the revelation of truth. We'd like to try to work it out ourselves as well, but we want it to be solved. In some ways, mystery is solved through careful study and application, as we do with the Bible. Jesus himself had to unpack the scriptures on the road to Emmaus so that two of his disciples could understand why the Christ had to suffer. He taught them through the Old Testament, the prophets, the Psalms. Now, Jesus reveals the mystery of God. That's what Paul states. That's what we state. Paul and the apostles then are the messengers of that revelation. And they challenge the speculative approaches of the leaders that are plugging into the mystery pagan practices and religions of the day. The Greek way of thinking. What seems to be worldly wisdom. Now, we can too easily speculate about what the Bible does say or does reveal. But that is speculation. We can only build upon the foundations already laid for us by Jesus Christ, as revealed by God through Jesus. And of course, Paul directs us to do that in chapter three, where he says you can only build on one foundation. In our world, we have much to speculate over, as we've already talked about in regards to the sad news uh, this week regarding coronavirus. The trials we face, the virus we fear. Yet our directive as a church has not changed. We're to be lights in the world pointing to the revelation of Jesus. If in doubt, we return to the foundation. Jesus Christ, what he's taught, what he reveals from God. We don't go along with our own assumptions, but rather come back to what Jesus says and Jesus reveals in his word. So Paul goes on to say in his letter, he's not concerned by the judgments of men or even his own judgments. His foundation is sure, but he doesn't let that become an excuse to proclaim his innocence. He knows his weaknesses all too well. And to be honest, the Corinthians should know theirs. He doesn't rely on his own self-evaluation. He's not saying, I know I'm right, so there, but rather, I know my failings, but I, I lay before you the revealed word of God. He recognises the judgment of God, who knows the motives of men's hearts, including his own. So we could ask from that, what then influences the motivations of our hearts? What teacher would not say that they 
serve God. That's a reliable defence, isn't it? Well, Paul's defence isn't an evaluation, but rather a humble approach towards the work of God and the word of God as he sees it in his own life. Later in his letter, he describes his own weaknesses. In another letter, he boasts about them. He's not prideful or boastful in the way the Greeks are, but boastful in his own weaknesses. He points to the established word of God and is accountable to his fellow apostles who have also been confirmed in their calling. So the teachers in Corinth were none of these things. We even get teachers today who must come under the authority of God's, God's word first, as well as reflect humbly on what influences their teaching. What influences us? How do we judge our own ministry? Now, fair enough, Paul says, I don't judge, but then I don't count myself to be innocent. So he's not saying all judgment is wrong. Now, I could spend a long time talking about judgment here, and it's a very important matter to think about. Well, we're not going to go into it in full depth, but consider these thoughts. Explore these thoughts and these verses further at home and discuss them maybe with your spouse or a friend and dig a bit deeper. So first of all, we're to deal with a person according to their character. And thus, we must judge character based on the description given in scripture. We are to judge sin, which is clearly defined by scripture and clearly evident in our life and, of course, in the life of others. We're to make judgments on spiritual matters involving believers. We're to judge the doctrinal truth of what we're taught. There are also matters we cannot judge. We're not to judge the convictions of a brother or sister in the Lord. We're not to judge or speak against a brother or sister in matters which the scriptures have not defined as a sin and for which there's no biblical support. To do this would be placing ourselves above the word of God and to pass judgment on God's law and God, the lawgiver, the judge. Explore some of these things yourselves a little bit more deeply as well. But one might think that Paul is thinking more of himself than he ought to. But look how he describes the work of the apostles. From chapter 3, verse 5, he uses three terms, which we often translate as servant. So these are the characteristics of a true leader. If a leader has come to serve, they serve as a co-worker. They're a trusted steward, a care of the flock. And in verse 6, Paul says he's applied these things to Apollos and himself, so that they may understand the meaning, do not go beyond what is written. That's his foundation, the written revelation of Jesus Christ and how easy it is for them and for us indeed to jump into judgment and teaching based on speculative mystery rather than the revealed word of God. Like in the mystery thrillers, you go with what the evidence tells you. Even if you have a hunch, you need the evidence. And this is what Paul is saying. Don't twist the word of God. Keep to it. And that's our guide to Christian behavior. Now, this is to defend the church from taking pride in one man over the other. One leader over the other. That leader I follow, that leader I don't. He's no good. That is something Paul tells them to avoid. But rather to assess their words and their deeds with the revealed word of God is what they say and what they do, does it match? Now, Paul has identified here the characteristic of a genuine teacher in their obedience to the word of God and to clear instruction. He avoids the speculative revelation and keeps the established revelation of God through Jesus Christ. That's our starting point this morning. And as we come into the second part of our message, we'll explore more what that characteristic looks like in action. We've seen the word, what does it look like in action for leader and for Christian believer? It's affirm what we've just heard from Ligon. How firm a foundation you say
so the leaders that the Corinthians have been modeling themselves after had led them to be prideful and to behave as if they'd had the benefits of the kingdom in their fullness now and that without God. Now, the worldly vision uh, of our world today, that the, the, the vision that most countries are aiming towards is to create their own version of utopia on earth with man as king rather than the way of Christ, which is, of course, the cross, self-denial. And the vision a Christian has is of a new heaven and a new earth where Christ is king and where God dwells with humanity in perfect unity. The church's vision was limited to their leader's immature and divisive wisdom. So in verse 7, Paul says, what makes you superior? What gifts do you have that were not from God in the first place? The apostles hadn't even attained the, the riches and certainly not behaving like kings that the Corinthians were doing. So Paul then comes into a tragic irony in which he describes quite impressively what the life of the Christian is like. We pick up on a similar tragedy in Revelation chapter 3, where John is inscribing the letter to the seven churches and to the church in Laodicea. He writes, you say, this is God's words to the church in Laodicea. Jesus himself is saying these words. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. From verse 9 then through to verse 13, Paul illustrates the brutal reality of the life of the apostle, which he and his fellows are going through. And indeed, the threat towards life for the Christian believer, for you and me. Much like some churches today who profess that they all have wealth and health and the kingdom of heaven is in their grasp now. And all those who suffer the fallen world just haven't accepted the work of the cross that is contradictory to the clear teaching of Jesus and demonstrated in the life of Paul in these words, as well as in later and other letters to the Corinthians when he boasts in his weaknesses. Look what's happened to me. It's not to say we copy that life. It's not to say we have to pursue poverty and hardship and suffering, because I tell you this, Christian, it will come to you no matter what. The Christian life is a hard as well as a happy road. There are times of great joy and hope. But let us not be fooled that this time of suffering and darkness was foretold in the Bible because we live in a fallen world and we are in a cursed world, a world that has rebelled against God and hence the need to repent and come back to him. Now, Jesus' words in John 16 ring true. This is what he writes. He says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me, in Jesus, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take courage, word for today. I have overcome the world. What encouragement that is. Now, the Corinthians, of course, they've forsaken the written word. They've twisted the written word. They no longer pursue the sound doctrine. So Paul makes clear the path of the believer. It's like one of being at the end of a procession, like criminals condemned to die. Now, the criminals at the end of these processions he's thinking of were slaves who were treated like animals. Let's look further into this description. It doesn't talk about us being kings and pretending to be kings and wealthy and healthy. Rather, he says, look, we are fools for Christ. The wisdom of Christ is foolishness to the wisdom of the world. We're weak. We're dishonoured. We're hungry. We're thirsty. We're in rags. We're brutally treated. We're homeless. We work with our own hands. We bless when we are cursed. We endure persecution. When slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. Now friends, not many of us can 
claim to have that experience of a Christian walk. When you compare the suffering we're going through today, is it comparable to that? And aren't there people in the world today who are going through that? Now, this is not to make little of our trouble and our trial, because everyone's trial is different. Some will go through harder times as God directs. Some will go through easier times. But it's the same God who sustains you through it. And here, doesn't he give a pattern of Christian behavior through that suffering? Look at us. We've been dishonored, hungry, thirsty. We're in rags. We're badly treated. We're homeless. And yet, when they're cursed, they bless. When they are persecuted, they endure it. When slandered, they answer kindly. Do we have that same attitude? Now, that is a great challenge for us. And it's a hard challenge. But it's one which we can take humbly on our knees before God, maybe in tears, and say, Lord, you know I'm not righteous. I'm not even close to being righteous. But your son, Jesus Christ, what he has done for me, that he should be mindful of me and go to the cross for me and suffer for me, knowing full well that I would suffer as well taking my sin and enabling me by his spirit to endure. Oh Lord, help us to endure. Let the image sink in. Do you think that the Christian life is going to be a lavish one? As I've just said, we don't even experience a tenth of what Paul describes and we probably cringe at how we might respond if we did. Note the clauses that Paul uses at the top and tail of this description of this image. First, we've been made a spectacle for the whole universe before angels and men. Now, Jesus was the same. He was made a spectacle before the heavens and the earth and held the sin of the world. So his followers, too, cannot expect any less than that. The Christian who suffers does not suffer in secret or alone. His suffering is made visible, if not by men, then at least by God. God is not blind to the suffering of the world or to your suffering. He knows your suffering because he himself through Christ has suffered. And then we have that second clause at the end. Up to this moment, Paul signals here the temporary nature of the condition. The path is hard and the fame is shame. But the reward, oh, the reward is eternal peace and reconciliation with God as the true ruler. A bit like the POW who is sitting in his camp knowing they've won the war, but waiting for the army to come in and reclaim him. Waiting for the time when their oppressor will be judged and they will be freed. That's where we're at at the moment. Or as in described in Romans, the pregnant woman waiting to give birth. She has birth pains waiting for the birth, but the joy of the child that will come. Maybe we would do well to take note of the description of the apostles as experienced by the poorest people in society. Rather than doing our best to look slick, maybe we need to do our best to look human and convey the human condition and live for the eternal destination. Let's not live for the comfort of the world now or the comforts the world has to offer. Rather, should we not aim for heaven? And if heaven for you is on earth, well, what a poor man's heaven it is. Verse 14 then typifies the heart and character of Paul's writing as we come to a conclusion this morning. Paul is not writing to shame, he says. He's writing to warn. He wants to demonstrate that true godly wisdom and the message of the cross, which is foolishness to the perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. True power is not in worldly words of clever persuasion, 
but rather the action that is rooted in belief. Paul's method is grace, not shame. I could speak a wonderful speech. I could inspire you with my words. But if I do not act what I preach, what use is it to you? Paul gives us insight into how he sees himself and how he sees all leaders. He says that they have many guardians in Christ, that is the Corinthian church, which of course might refer to their spiritual, eternal well-being. In Christ you've got tens of thousands of guardians. But who are your fathers on earth? Paul is a father to them. Now, a father in the Bible especially loves teaches, cares for, disciplines his child, leads the way. That's the work of Paul in Christ through the gospel. He's been instructed and in turn instructs his children. Now we might squirm like children when we're referred to as children. No one really likes that, do they? However, spiritual maturity and condition grows from infancy, as described in chapter 3, through to maturity and godly wisdom, spiritual milk to solid food. Now, Paul has done this and will continue to do this, but of course he's not there in person. So he sends his son in the Lord, Timothy, his representative, to remind them of his way in life in Jesus Christ. And notice that, not his way in life, but his way in life in Jesus Christ. Paul tells them to imitate him. This is possibly my favourite idea from scripture. I love inspirational role models who live out their values and character. As a child, there were many role models in my life. I looked up to them and followed them and aspired to be like them, including my parents, who knew that one day the teaching and guidance I received from these people would help me in my teaching and guiding others. And still I look for those role models. But of course, we always have one particular role model, don't we? To help line up our values and way of life, to say, am I living for Christ? Am I living like Christ? And that is Jesus Christ. Jesus, he is our ultimate role model. He's given us the disciples and the apostles who taught the scriptures and wrote them down for us in the New Testament. He then impels them to carry that instruction on generation after generation in church teaching, consistently teaching the same. Some have argued how church teaching has changed. Well, style may have changed, but the word of God hasn't changed pretty much from the early church. We're almost a little bit like builders who build on a foundation already laid. But here's a question, and I asked this question again because I asked it last time. Who's your spiritual father or role model? Who do you go back to when you need to get yourself back on track or you need to check on something you're thinking or understanding? Who is your influencer in your life? Paul is demonstrating himself as a very different role model and leader to the one the Corinthians are looking towards. In another passage in scripture, 2 Corinthians but chapter 11, Paul writes, you being so wise, bear with the foolish gladly. You bear with anyone who enslaves you. If he devours you, if he takes advantage of you, if he exalts himself, if he hits you in the face. To my shame, I must say that we have been weak in comparison. But in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness, I am just as bold myself. You see, the unholy leaders whom some found so appealing were authoritarian leaders. They were men who led the same way the pagans ruled over others. They pushed people around and their followers loved it. Paul is consistent in style, content and the way he lives. One of the best viral media posts I saw uh, hitting the internet last year was during homeschooling in America. There was a class of infants, maybe six, seven years old, being led by a teacher online. And her connection dropped, it dropped straight out, and the children were faced with an ethical dilemma. 
One child immediately pointed out that they shouldn't mess around or misbehave because their teacher might still be watching. And not only that, the lesson's being recorded. So they'll know if we're misbehaving. At that realization, all the children continued to act as if their teacher was still there. They knew how to behave. Now, that's not so easy for us, though, is it? When the church in Corinth thought Paul was distant and these ably spoken leaders came into their lives, their behavior changed. They followed their influences. So Paul reminds them that he's coming and he's not coming with the same equipment and discourses as these leaders. Rather, he's saying something like this. I care nothing for their high resounding speech. But what I desire to know is their power, whether they be really powerful in the spirit or not. The predominant feature of Greek character was a love of the power of discourse rather than of godliness, which, of course, was evident in Corinth. Not empty speeches, please but the manifest power of the spirit, which attests to the presence of the kingdom of God in the church and in the Christian believer. So let me come to a conclusion. Thank you for bearing with me this morning. Let's be aware of how we're influenced, what we allow to influence us in this world. What cliques do we attach ourselves to? How have we developed a spiritual pride over or against another person? Do we need to reconnect with a spiritual father or do we even have one? Our world at the moment is beset with the overbearing sounds of attention seeking leaders and cultural celebrities. And we need to engage with them. We can't ignore them. But first, let us get our foundations right. Before we fall into the same traps as the church in Corinth, let's form a deeper love for God's word and sound teaching. Let's get back to basics. Let's seek the role models that visibly demonstrate Christ-like character and behavior. Let's be spiritually aware of our own model behavior, which can influence and impact others. Let's take these things to heart, not as a whip, but rather in love and with a gentle spirit. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus Christ and for his model behavior. We're sorry for the times we've allowed pride or, or other influences to affect our Christian way of life. We're sorry when we've not behaved as we believe. And we're sorry sometimes, Lord, that we do not believe or behave as you would have us. And Lord, in this dark and troubled time, we pray for a renewal of your spirit's power in our lives. Not just to speak the speak, but to walk the walk. Let us be enabled by your spirit to walk for you as Paul walked that hard, painful road. And yet with the goal of heaven in his eyesight. Lord, we walk to the goal of glory. And though we cannot know why this time is happening, Lord, or, or when it will come to an end, we can set our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith and the one who will lead us through this dark and strange time into the revealed truth of your word and grace and hope. May we know the hope of Christ today, we pray. Amen. Let us join in this worship song to lift our spirits up as we face this next week together in prayer. God bless you. to raise but what
Sin 